for teaching purpose and we've collected data from our own experience that the cases and other things from we have acknowledged wherever we have taken material from there's no financial interest a conflict of interest now the will the way that we'll go about this is that i'll first give a small introduction about grand lomas this is important because uh, you would have learned grand lomas as an undergraduate so as post graduate there are certain extra things that you are expected to know how much it helps you and question that you learn in due course of time and uh, then we'll come to the cases it's not possible to cover all aspects of granulomatous inflammation we'll just give you some examples so that you can work on them as you learn so first of all we come to the definition of a granuloma so basically it's a collection of mature mononuclear phagocytes it's called mature because the moment it's immature you think of neoplastic disease and it is not necessarily accompanied by necrosis or other features so where there is no necrosis some people call it pure granuloma and where there is necrosis and other features they call some people use the term complex granuloma there are other definitions it's a inflammatory response to the chronic type with collections of macrophages epithelial cells and multinucleate cells and so everywhere what is important is whatever definition you take it's a organized collection of mononuclear phagocytes with or without giant cells or necrosis and so on so, so please note that the word epithelioid is often misspelled there after l there is a no sitting between two i's and then there is a d so epithelium epithelii then instead of um there is oid so that's one thing you have to remember uh end result of granulomas is healing and repair so you have fibrosis so now we will go to the next slide so if you see the first time granuloma was used was by rudolf ripko himself most of the things that we are talking about took place in a span of 10 years between 1863 and 70 1872 so virko used the term granuloma for the first time he had seen giant cells but he never mentioned that there were giant cells at such so he said there are cells with some 50 60 nuclei that you see but it was Theodor Langan in 1868 he used the term giant cell and we know that in tuberculosis he used the term Langan's giant cell after his name because at that time he described it in tuberculosis Wagner described what called epithelioid cells some people say it's Robert Koch and Cornell they also used this name but however the first case of inflammation with epithelial cells in addition to tuberculosis was described in a fungal joint um, synovitis by a person called Costa it was in 1877 that Schuppel claimed three obligate cellular elements giant cells epithelial cells and you can see other things like necrosis so in this 10 years this thing happened so just in case you forget how will call look like and theodor langans looks like here are the two stalwarts so the first thing that you have to understand in any granuloma is that important cell is the histiocyte now histiocyte generally have two major functions one is antigen presentation and another is phagocytosis the antigen presenting cells the macrophages or histiocytes can present but the cells that are specially endowed with the antigen presentation are the langan cells and dermal dendrocytes the phagocyte is known as a macrophage phage means eating up 
macro is a little larger cell. So that's why it's called macrophage. And the macrophage has got various functions, including response in wound healing, in addition to phagocytic cytotoxic and regulation of inflammation. The disorders of monocytes, histiocytes, and macrophages divided into three categories. Functional defects, they are mostly hereditary, like in Gaucher's disease, Neiman Pick, Shadia Kigashi. One of the other enzymes are not working properly, or the accumulation of various substances in these. Reactive responses, which are non neoplastic, and then, of course, neoplastic like histiocytic sarcoma, Langerhans cells, histiocytic, then dendritic cells. Macrophages are generally so what we are going to talk about today is mainly phagocytic cells and the reactive response. We will not delve upon the functional or the neoplastic diseases. So, granulomas are related to phagocytic cells and they are responsive to certain external noxious stimuli. The macrophage is generally a large cell with a vesicular nucleus and you can get a small nucleolar. Sometimes you do find certain gobbled up material. The Langeran cells on the other hand are more characterized by the nuclei which may have grooves. I am sorry, I will take this laser pointer. Yeah, they have these grooves and the nuclei are irregular actually they are folded and that's why you have this grooved appearance. Dendritic cells on the other hand they are found especially in the lymph nodes. They often occur in pairs. They are more vacuolated than the centroblast of the surrounding cells. Right? And they have a small nuclei in them. So this is how the dendritic cells look like. So we are talking about these cells not about this one. Okay? So the macrophage you have to know, they are embryonic in origin, they come from the bone marrow, the hematopoietic stem cell, and they invariably get located in various organs in the body. Now these macrophages which come directly from the embryonic stem cell, they are long, they live for a long time and they can renew themselves. On the other hand, these organs also have monocytes which are circulating in the circulation and whenever required, they enter into the tissue. These monocytes are short-lived and they come on demand. So you have two types of cells, the monocytes from the bloodstream and from the bone marrow directly in prenatal life. These cells generally go by certain names, like for example, in the lung, they are alveolar macrophages, in the liver, they are in the brain, they are microglial In the brain, especially, this is important because the blood brain barrier opens for a short period in the prenatal period, and all these cells populate them. The leptomeningeal cells are essentially those which have come from the bone marrow. Very rarely, you the brain opens up to uh, welcome the other monocytes. Then, of course, in the intestine, skin, and kidneys, you have them. Now, this is very important to note. Okay, then we'll come to the different types. So, you have the embryonic deadite macrophages. They're mainly tissue specific. They go into the bone as osteoclasts, microglial cells, alveolar macrophage, kufa cells, histiocytes, white pulp, red pulp literal cells and so on and so forth. But in addition, when uh, there's a whole lot of trafficking of movement, especially from the peripheral blood cells, where you have the inflammatory monocytes. These are short-lived, these are long-lived, but they have essentially similar things. So different tissues have different things. For example, the CNS and the epidermis, mainly the Langerhans cells, they are all the original from the bone marrow, whereas in the intestine and the dermis, the majority are from the monocytes that come from the bloodstream. The remaining have a mixture of both of them. But when these are depleted, that is 
in the case of inflammation and so on, the monocytes jump into the scene and they populate those organs whenever required. These sir, macrophages... Sir, can I excuse me, sir? Yeah. yeah. Sir, there are some of the uh, attendees calling that it's a very soft voice. Can you be a little louder, sir? Yeah, now can they hear me? Uh, can you make the volume full? It is still not yeah, full. Yeah, yeah. Full. Yeah. Full. Yeah. full. Full? Thank you, sir. Okay. Okay, now macrophages have got a variety of receptors. So, you know, they are one cell with perhaps one of the maximum number of receptors, so they have a variety of functions. Not going to that. But what you have to know is an activated macrophage is generally of two types M1 and M2. The M1 is the classically activated one by bacteria, by other organisms. They are pro-inflammatory. They, they result in a Th1 or cell-mediated response and they function for host defense and anti-tumor anti immunity. M2 are alternatively activated by <laughs> The first part is fighting the organism. Second part is when, when that is done, tissue repair sets in and M2 macrophages are actually for that. Now M1 macrophages, you can do CD80 or INOS to identify them. M2, you can do a CD163 or 206-209 to identify them. Now the importance of these two will come later. Morphologically, it's very difficult to distinguish two. Now, do, how do the macrophages become M1 or M2? If all macrophages have got arginine. So, if they activate the um, INOS pathway, they produce nitric oxide and they become M1 macrophages, which inhibit cell proliferation. They look, they gobble up bacteria and so on. So Suppose they activate the arginase pathway, then from orthine uh, they produce ornithin and use urea. They become M2 macrophages and this helps in cell proliferation and repair. So you see there are two types, M1 and M2 macrophages depending on their function. So you have to understand what is good with M1 macrophages can therefore become M2, M2 can become M1 whenever required. So there is a good admixture of these two types of macrophages and the cells can uh, go from one to another, okay. So the macrophages have got a function which is called SHIP, what is sampling, they either sample the bacteria or the area that has to be healed. Okay. They heal or inhibit bacteria and then they present antigen. They are not very good at presenting antigen, but never mind. M2 is for Th2 or antibody, they present to B cells. M1 is for Th1 or cytotoxic and they present to cytotoxic T cells. So you see, these macrophages do a lot of function that way. Now, can, how do you distinguish morphologically is there difference well in cell culture and all they say the m2 are larger cells than m1 okay and it's very difficult to make out in tissue unless you do an immunohistochemistry now in a will you get m1 or m2 exclusively no you generally get a mixture for example this is in a cholesteatoma and you find in this cholesteatoma it's in the healing phase Although there are M1, which is identified by CD80, and M2 by CD163, there is the admixture of M1 and M2. There is a preponderance of M2 because it is in the healing phase. Right? Now, this is in a non-necrotic and a necrotic granuloma, and this is in a non-granulomatous tissue. So, this is the stain for macrophages in general, CD68. This is INOS, and this is... CD206. So you see, you can get a mixture of both of them, 
depending on when it is required. Now here we come, the macrophages, if they are unable to tackle the bacteria or the foreign material, they generally become more active and become what are called epithelioid cells. Epithelioid cells are so called because they form a, almost a syncytion. One cell joins another, there is almost a tight junction between all these macrophages as if they have formed an epithelium. How are they identified? They have an eosinophilic cytoplasm, they almost join each other and they have a nucleus which is slightly elongated or irregular and classically they are supposed to be shaped like a slipper. This is the sole, this is the toe, toe end and therefore in undergraduates we say that they are slipper like nuclei. But it is not necessary that you will always find slippers. Eh? So you can find them round, they can find them oval and you have a dot like nuclei in there, nucleoli in there. Okay. Please remember the term epithelioid is used to indicate epithelial like morphology. Various tumors are called epithelioid tumors but they are not similar to the epithelioid cells in granulomas which are essentially macrophages. For example, in pecomas, epithelioid cells are not macrophages. They have origin from melanocytes and smooth muscle cells. Epithelioid discs are gist cells only. They are interstitial cells of Kahal. Epithelioid leomyosarcomas are smooth muscle cells. So you can have a variety of epithelioid uh, um, the term epithelioid used to prefix tumors, don't mistake them for epithelioid cells of the granule. Right? So how are they different from usual macrophages? They have a lot more macro, uh, lysozymes compared to the usual macrophages. They have interdigitating surfaces that lock with the surrounding ones and they also have this cup-like depression in the edges of most of these cells. So these are the features by which you identify epithelial cells. They are rich in E gathering, that's why they join with each other, can do a stain. They also may have placoglobulin and other things. Sometimes they also have uh, actin in them. So you see this is how they become a tight granuloma or organized to form all these cells. So this is what you see in a granuloma. Now a granuloma is like the fire of a medical college. A whole lot of people going in and going out. So it's not only just epithelial cells with necrosis and the organism. You can have T cells, V cells, NK cells, neutrophils, mass cells and even blood vessels. Whole lot of cells in there. One thing is some studies have shown that the center of the granulomas, if it is necrotic, obviously have M1 cells more than M1 are pro-inflammatory, they are more phagocytic, they secrete nitric oxide. So they are more killing in that way. M2 are in the periphery, they are more involved with healing, fibrosis and repair and that is why in the periphery of granulomas you get fibrosis, central area necrosis. The M2 are more e catherin positive than M1. So you see, you have a non-epithelial granuloma, then you have epithelial. Then they become necrotic if there is uncontrolled infection. The right amount of TNF is not there. Then they become necrotic. On the other hand, if they have IL-13, TGF, beta-1, then they become more toward the M2 and they become fibrous. Some granulomas will have more of giant cells than the epithelial cells, right? So we'll come to that. So what are these giant cells? The giant cells are generally because of homotypic cell fusion. Homotypic means similar cells fusing with each other. Now I'll ask you a question. Can you give an example of heterotypic cell fusion? Divyanko, just give them 10 seconds. Give an example of heterotypic cell fusion. 
two different cells fusing together. Any response? No, sir, What? not yet. No response. Oh. Okay. You must uh, go for it. The uh, asking for this uh, egg, egg cell and the sperm cells. Anyone? Yes. Is one. That that the way? Yes, yes. You are absolutely right. The best example is spermatozoa and ova fusing together to form the embryo. Yeah. Yeah. Someone has written it on the. Yeah, very good. Yes. Very good. Very good. so the giant cells are because of macrophages fusing with each other which is called homotopy this happens even in tumor cells what is the size we call a giant cell there is no definite size but they are generally large but some authors say it is that usually more than 40 micrometers in size 40 to 120 they may have one large nucleus or two or three nucleus generally they are two or three so you classify them as physiological and pathological physiologically are osteoclast syncytial prophoblast and megakaryocyte okay now how many nuclei do megakaryocytes have just 10 seconds any other students who are here today that is very simple question is enough answer but actually there is endomitosis in that uh, so uh, around 70 matlab ma'am sir 1x to 72x 72 times the uh, nuclear is uh, increased uh, dna is increased <laughs> yeah it actually Megakarya megakaryocytes have a single nucleus which is lobated. But the amount of DNA, or yes, you are right because of endomitosis, um, it can it can replicate and it can go larger and larger. But unfortunately, in tissue sections, because they are cut across, you find as if they have multiple nuclei. Please remember this when you are doing uh, when you. looking at mega cavity don't make the mistake of saying there are multiple nuclei they may have 64 dna or 32 copies of the normal complement of dna in human cell okay pathological could be in human cell yeah sir then why it is a fusion matlab how can we call, uh, call it a fusion when there is no 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 it is it, you see that's why it is generally but not limited to So it's not always due to fusion. Means it's a large cell. Okay? That's why megakaryocyte is an example of it. Now among the inflammatory cells, inflammatory giant cell is a foreign body, Langhans cell, Anishkov cell, the Anishkov cell. You have in uh, rheumatic heart disease, two-toned giant cell in which there's a central cellular area with nuclei, and then you have again. In Langan cells, they are arranged in the periphery like a horseshoe, or all around like a wreath. Foreign body, they are just scattered all over. What is this type of cell for? Anybody? As an undergraduate, we expect one, two, and three. and yeah. they can tell yeah. this also very good so now you tell this extra one anybody okay so few replies are there uh, osteoclastic and crouton cell very good this is called a crouton giant cell crouton giant cell is a giant cell With lot of cryptococci in them, so cryptococci looking like two-ton giant cell because the nucleus are in the center. They are called crouton giant. Anyway, croutons are nothing but you know those bread crumbs that they put on top of uh, soup and other things, small pieces of bread that are fried. Okay, this is crouton giant cell. Yeah. So pathological viral infection. You have herpes, cytomegaloo, Warden-Fingal D. and respiratory sensitivity 
So these are the giant cells seen in viral infection. In tumors, osteoclastoma, rich Sternberg cell, anaplastic tumor giant cell. They may have just one nucleus, which is very large. The cell is large, and of course, they have irregular nucleoli and so on and so forth. And you can have a rhabdomyoblast. Then there are others, neonatal giant cell hepatitis, a large hepatocyte with three or more nuclei and a muscle giant cell. So you see, this is the list of the various types of giant cells that you see. If anybody asks you as a postgraduate, at least try to tell some of them and classify like this, you'll be able to remember most of them. Right? So this is a crouton giant cell which has got this nuclei here. These are all cryptococci, right? And it's seen in cryptococcus. Okay, so you do a stain, you'll find PA stain is enough. What are titan cells? Anybody can tell? Okay. Anyone? Okay, the event show. Yes, sir. Nobody has said, no? No, no. Okay. Titan cells are large cryptococci, more than 15 microns in size. More usual cryptococci are 2 to 4 microns. So these large cells, it's very important. If you see them in tissue section, you please tell they have a thick capsule. The importance is they're seen in the lungs. They are more pathogenic, they cause dissemination and they are resistant to the usual antifungal treatment. Okay. The other thing that you must remember in giant cells are inclusions. This is an asteroid body, Schumann body are calcified, then oxalate crystals you can get, cholesterol crystals and Hamazaki Wiesenberg bodies which can stain like almost like yeast with a silver stain but they are mainly liposuction and other material. All this can be seen in carbon, right? but they are not specific. You can see these in tuberculosis also, you can see in fungal infection but anyway they are helpful in the diagnosis. Can anybody say who this is? No one. No reply, sir. He is shaman. Just in case you haven't seen him earlier. Okay? He is a Swedish dermatologist and he described the shaman bodies in Now, so you have these macrophages. They become giant cells. If MCSF rankle is there, they become osteoclast. If IL-6 and interferon gamma is there, they become foam cells and two-ton cells. If interferon gamma and IL-3 is there, they become Langan giant cells. If IL-4 and IL-13 is there, they become foreign body giant cells. So this is how the different giant cells are formed. Okay? So depending on the cytokine that is available, the cells become like that. So certain terms in granuloma, Histiocytic aggregates are loose aggregates of histiocytes. Ill-defined granulomas are the small cells loosely arranged. This is an ill-defined granulomas composed metronomically of giant cells. This is an ill-defined granuloma in the liver. They, it looks like a granuloma but not so well defined. These are well defined granulomas. If the Cells are little separated out, they are called loose granulomas. If they are compact, they are called compact granulomas. Typical of sarcoidosis. Right? Focal granulomas are granulomas located separately in small, small areas. This is in sarcoidosis where they are perilymphangious, like bronch and bronchocentric. Okay? So, this is uh, focal granuloma in tuberculosis. Diffuse granuloma is where they are not well defined. Classical is lepromatous leprosy. So, you have focal granulomas, diffuse, 
compact and loose. Compact granulomas without necrosis are called hard granulomas in the case of tuberculosis. With necrosis, they are called uh, sorry, just something somebody wants. Uh, hard granulomas, they are called. I'm sorry, I'm supposed to do something. It's not moving. Yeah, because somebody has asked to share. Or <coughs> okay, so hard granulomas, and uh, if they are necrotic, they are called soft granulomas in tuberculosis. This is a necrotizing granuloma. This is a non-necrotizing granuloma. Non-immunological granulomas are those which do not have lymphocytic cover. Immunological granulomas have a lymphocytic cover. So these are the different terms that are used. Discrete granulomas are granulomas separated from each other. They are single giant cell systems. You have epithelial cell and maybe one giant cell. Confluent granulomas are granulomas which join with each other with multiple giant cells. So this is typical of sarcoidosis. Confluent granulomas are typical of tuberculosis. Single cell granuloma. Macrophages become spindle cells and in the form of a granuloma or spindle cell granuloma. Typical is hysteroid leprosy. Right? What are these granulomas? Anybody can say? The donut granuloma. So they are called donut granulomas, but the correct name is fibrin ring. ring. This is a fibrin ring. Okay. This is a marshy scarlet blue stain, and this is just a PA stain. You have a fat in the middle. Epithelial cells all around them, and the middle of the epithelial cells, you have some fibrinous material. Okay, these are fibrin ring granulomas, typically seen in coxilla burnetii or Q fever, but you can get them in hepatitis A, CMV, EBV, reaction to certain checkpoint inhibitor therapy, especially seen in the liver, bone marrow. What is this granuloma? Fat. With these cells. This is called an oleogranuloma or fat granuloma, typically seen in NASH. Okay? Xanthogranuloma. And this is xanthogranulomatous inflammation. There is a difference between the two. This is not a reactive process, just a juvenile xanthogranuloma. It's called a xanthogranuloma, but it's mainly a neoplastic process. Whereas this Xanthogranulomatous inflammation seen in urinary tract ovaries and gallbladder typically is the granulomatous inflammation we are talking about. They have foamy macrophages, giant cells and cholesterol cells. This is a bile granuloma. So bile granulomas are nothing but infrustrated bile with a granulomatous response seen in the biliary obstruction. So you can have in the liver ill-defined portal granulomas bile duct centric granulomas and zone 3 granulomas. So bile duct centric and bile granulomas are seen in biliary obstruction and PBC. So they have different types of granulomas much more than just necrotizing and non-necrotizing. Fibrin ring, you had the oleogranulomas, spindle cell granulomas and bile granulomas. Okay. Now they are named as granulomatous disease but they are not conventional granuloma. Like for example, giant cell reparative granuloma is a benign reactive process, process where you get lot of osteoclast giant cells and macrophages, but they are not included on the granulomatous inflammation. Plasma cell granuloma is a benign lesion composed of mainly plasma cells and some histiocytes seen in the oral cavity tongue and gingiva. It's called a plasma cell granuloma, but it is not the granuloma we are talking of today. Okay? Chronic granulomatous disease, that is CGD, it is because of NADPH oxidase complex, there is a problem there, and therefore they cannot generate superoxide. 
and there is a granulomatous inflammation the neutrophils do not work the macrophages do not work so they convert to granulomas the macrophages and you get white spot granulomatous inflammation but this is not included in the inflammatory granulomas and other granulomas we are talking about today so non necrotizing granuloma there is a whole list from a to z starting from atypical tuberculosis to zirconium exposure for necro uh, there is a easy way think of rbcs and ldh foreign body reaction berylosis crohn disease sarcoidosis typical sarcoid type granuloma leprosy drug reaction hypersensitivity pneumonitis these are the common types and in some countries you can have toxic one rbc yes and ldh okay for necrotizing you have caseating coagulative necrosis fibrin necrosis and different types of necrosis they are mainly either because of infection due to bacteria parasite viruses or because of immunological mechanisms or vaccine these are the two major causes of necrotizing granuloma so you have non necrotizing necrotizing focal necrosis suppurative and so on so forth we'll come to each one of them please remember necrotizing is either because of an infection or because of autoimmune or vasculitic process these are the two major causes of necrotizing granuloma in cancers you can get granuloma one as a reaction to the cancerous material classical example is to keratin then granuloma associated with cancer like in renal cell carcinoma you can get granuloma sitting in the middle of the cancer granuloma even in breast you can get granuloma in lymph nodes you can get either with metastasis or without metastasis without metastasis is supposed to come for good prognosis all these granulomas are generally non necrotizing the location of granulomas is important for diagnosis for example in the lung if you get necrotizing it's a always a infection tuberculosis in our country in addition it may be other fungus lymphangio centric or next to bronchial markers if they are there likely to be sarcoid perivascular majority giant cells with some talc like material think of talc granuloma if it is in the vessel wall it's a granulomatous vasculitis within the alveolar it may be intra alveolar loose granuloma within the interstitium if it is in peribronchial area expanding and closing the lumen and if it's spray bronchiolar which is loose you have different etiology so it could be tuberculosis fungal if it is lymphangio centric sarcoid berylosis if it is perivascular non polarizable sarcoid or berylosis polarizable tal granulomatous vasculitis autoimmune or systemic vasculitis if it is within the alveoli think of cobalt in the interstitium tight granuloma in addition to sarcoid you could think of hot tub lung disease because of mac or previum intracellular if it is pushing into the lumen granuloma hypersensitivity to pneumonitis it is loose not pushing bagasosis but these are not typically seen in all of these cases you may see a case of sarcoid without these typical findings please remember that you have to use the clinical radiological and other findings available with you okay in fact there are various algorithms in which you can do this look at this granuloma so we come to the first case case 1 kiran can you just take it up please the slide for diagnosis what did you see so it's a section from fiber progenous tissue mm. so it's a collection of Uh, multinucleotide genesis mm. uh rimmed by lymphocytes okay uh in the center shows fiber uh, foreign body okay so probably maybe attack can others mute please okay please 
Sir? There's some sound coming. Okay, okay, this good. Okay. Yeah. Good? And this is polarizable medium. Yes, sir. So, so what is that foreign body? Foreign body, yeah. Okay. Probably talk, talk. Okay. okay. You know, in this granuloma, the most characteristic feature is almost entirely made up of giant cells. They are of the foreign body type. They are not Langone's type, number one. Whenever you see a granuloma full of giant cells, mainly of the foreign body type, search for a foreign body. It is unlikely to be infective because if it is infective, you would have found epithelioid and other cells. Secondly, you will notice there is hardly, the lymphocytic infiltration is called sparse. So it is a relatively non-immunological type of granuloma, not much. And then of course you are finding the foreign body. Now in the foreign body, here you are finding most of them are rounded. If they are rounded and they are more almost similar to each other, almost similar, some are cut across, it is very unlikely to be talc. This talc it does not look like this. So you see, this is a suture granule. Okay. So now you see, sutures, if they are like this, you see, two things you have to see in suture. See, talc is like this. Now the sutures you will find, nowadays most of the sutures are rounded almost similar to each other. These are called monofilament sutures. They are either vicryl or, or proline sutures. Okay? So these are the common sutures. Both of them you can uh, polarize and you can find them. There are other foreign bodies that you can get. You can get gel foam, PVS sponge. These wide openings are the ones you get in mesh, polyester or polypropylene. Or sometimes you get silicone dressing. Chrome gut you get rarely. Silk you will get. They are dark in color and they also polarize. Cotton you don't see. Can anybody tell what is this lesion? The finding giant cells. Little information and this hyaline like material. You often get them. Anyone? Collagen, okay. See, when you find a lesion like this, you search and search you will invariably find this is called this is called I think Bindu has said pulse or hyaline granuloma the word pulse is meant for legumes or pulses so vegetable granulomas are called pulse or hyaline granuloma you see them because it is hyaline like material in them so remember, always search for this. Sometimes you know about this on this. You can get tattoo granuloma, whether you get all this. Okay. What, uh, what is this? Anybody? This a granuloma. Foreign body type. Hardly any cell. No lymphocytes. And you are finding this bluish gray material. Anybody? Some, some needle-like crystals are there. Gout. This is polarized. This is if you use the red interference of the back. This is how it is. Yeah, many people have said Piyush and some other people would serve as said that. Yeah, this is gout, urate list. Right? So this is gout. Okay, good. So now we come to case two. Uh, Agam, can you take this? Yes, sir. Or oh, uh, let's tell one of the ladies. Rashmi, take it. Rashmi, take it. Let's see. Case 2. 18 year old boy presented with cervical lymphadenopathy. Lymph node excision done for histopathological examination. Yeah, what I see? Uh, sections shows lymph node tissue 
with the multiple necrotizing granulomas okay so in this cover we can see the uh necrotizing granulomas <laughs> with composed of epithelial histocytes okay. some okay. giant cells okay. surrounded by lymphocytes okay. anything else here uh langen epoxy giant cells are seen mm, anything else mm. rashmi important thing is they are becoming confluent see yes granuloma is joining with that and that. that's an important finding necrotizing with confluent yeah okay yeah yeah very good anything else rashmi you want to add no rashmi can you hear me yes sir okay. yeah Anything you want to add further about central part? Anything else you want to add? Aceous necrosis. Aceous necrosis. Anything else? What has happened here? Here you are not seeing anything, no? Yes. most probably it has liquefied we can get liquefaction okay. what is this cell this is a typical langan cell okay for sure for sure and what is finding here this is also granulomas but it's looking slightly bluish because there may be some bluish and this is the same thing going on okay So is there a, what is your diagnosis most likely tuberculous uh, lymphadenitis any differential uh, it could be caused because of the fungal infection or something like that etiology is tuberculous anything you would like to do yeah uh zeal nilsen staining for the acid pass bacilli okay so you think it's tuberculous it is negative So what do you think you do? Anything rest me? Green expert. Can yeah PCR can be done to something. Okay. Anyway, in our country, no, we don't have to do the other things. Usually, it's considered as tuberculosis, and I'm sure with the clinical findings and all, in most places. if they can do the other test well and good if they don't sometimes they treat temporarily for tuberculosis now this is a reticulin stain what does it show we have very high incidence of drug resistant tb so gene expert uh, should be done in all yeah. yeah. to confirm and also to rule out drug resistance very ma'am present yes ma'am will give you the cases now so this is a reticulin stain in sarcoidosis no usually it is reticulin rich whereas in tuberculosis because of necrosis and destruction it is reticulin poor in sarcoidosis it is usually reticulin rich no? because there is fibrosis all this immuno im, immuno staining doesn't help you can get cd4 cd8 and so on this is to show you all our macrophages so necrotizing granulomas you have different type i told you once again remember there are two main etiology the necrosis can be rounded or defined irregular somewhat stellate it could be geographic and it could be basophilic with fibrinoid material geographic with eosinophilic areas it could be palisaded could be stellate but uniformly yes in it so now does the shape help you it does this is for example this is seen in tuberculosis this is seen in atypical mycobacteria or these you find see bluish in them right it could be seen in cat scratch disease mainly stellate with basophilic areas because they are neutrophils Okay, this typically 
if you get fibrinoid with geographic areas and blue think of vagueness if it is like this eosinophilic and geographic think of sarcoid which is necrotizing but is rare. you can get it in liver cancer palisade is mainly rheumatoid arthritis and it's stellate but uniformly eosinophilic you could get in a variety of conditions can, it can also be an infarct in a leomyoma or some other thing so the shape of the necrosis is, then you have caseous necrosis which is uniformly granular coagulative fibrinoid basophilic suppurative if there is neutrophils granular and eosinophilic will be caseous collagenolytic are more homogeneous neutrophilic then what do you do you think of certain conditions in caseous think of tuberculosis or fungus coagulative think of fibrinoid vasculitis autoimmune basophilic vagnus suppurative think of fungi always or parasite granular eosinophilic this collagenolytic then you have got these diseases which called uh, <laughs> there are certain group of diseases which occur mainly in the skin granuloma and other neutrophilic again think of fungi then you can do special stains to identify them sometimes you know please note search for granulomas near the blood vessels if you are searching for granulomas near blood vessels look for granulomas elsewhere with necrosis you can get this in sarcoid disease okay if there is fibrinoid necrosis in the wall of the vessels it is likely to be an autoimmune disease if it is basophilic think of vigness right if it is necrobiotic or collagenolytic granulomas like i told you if it is blue in color then if you do a mucin stain if it is rich in mucin then it's a mucinous necrobiotic granuloma think of granuloma anyway if it is rich in neutrophils but no mucin think of vagnus or rheumatoid vasculitis blue granuloma that is they are mainly blue in color if it is eosinophilic then it's typical collagenolytic it could be necrobiotic xanthogranuloma rheumatoid nodule cross or necrobiosis lipodica diabetica it depends on the location and other things sudhir will talk about them later you also have elastolytic granulomas where the elastic tissue is destroyed right you have two types elastolytic giant cell granuloma and actinolytic elastolytic granuloma these are the two. ma'am can you come over and show the tuberculosis case yes i'll stop sharing the screen so i have uh, three cases and thank you so much you really enjoyed all the different granulomas and there's so much to granulomas the first time i realized so let me show a clinician's perspective how do we see cases and when we refer the patients for a histological diagnosis along with that what other investigation we should uh, send and how a clinical picture will help you uh, as a pathologist uh, talking or discussing with your clinician colleagues to decide or come to the final diagnosis so young lady 28 year old she had tb in the past uh, march 22 was treated at a native place again she had recurrence of symptoms in may 2022 fever weight loss and typical uh, symptom and uh, in so she was treated with akt again august 22 she detected to have pleural effusion 
and she was started on first line anti tb treatment uh, she also had recurrent abdominal symptoms now we investigated her this is the x ray chest uh, you can see here not much is So the X-ray chest. What we normally see is try to look at uh, presence of any lymph nodes. So here there is no obvious lymph node that you can see. Let me just see the pointer. You can click on the right side of the mouse. You'll get pointer options. Just click on the right side of the mouse or both fingers on your touchpad. Otherwise, you can use your arrow. I'll use the arrow. Yeah. Huh. So this is the uh, commonly lymph nodes you see here in this area. It's called paratracheal area, right, and the left paratracheal, and the hilar area, the right hilum, and the left hilum. And so here the paratracheal and hilar area look normal. We try to look at the costophrenic angle, uh, costophrenic and the cardiophrenic angle for presence of any pleural effusion. We try to look for any lesions in the parenchyma. So we divide into three zones. This is upper zone, mid zone, and lower zone. So here you can see more or less the X-ray looks normal except for some possible. Now we did the CT scan. We had abdominal uh, nodes also. We biopsied that, but uh, the culture was again inconclusive. So we somehow wanted the diagnosis because the third time she has got TB and she was not clinically responding. So we did the CT scan, and you can see here uh, there is this right upper lobe lesion. Which is showing a good uptake. Her SUV was pretty high, more than eight. You can see here uh, the hilar lymph node, which is the, which is having uh, uptake, which was not evident on the chest X-ray. And uh, this is the same lesion in the right upper lobe. So ultimately, we decided to biopsy this lesion, do the histopathology, and send it for gene expert. So one important thing here is whenever we are suspecting TB clinically and radiologically. It is very important to send the tissue one in formally for histopathological evaluation and second sample simultaneously has to be collected, collected in normal saline or sending for gene expert A, B, smear, A, B culture. And if you are suspecting anything else, then bacterial culture or fungal culture. So that is that is very important because many times we get histopathological confirmation of drug, uh, I mean tuberculosis, but that's not enough for us as clinicians. We have to rule out uh, drug resistance. And culture is also important because sometimes non-tuberculous mycobacteria can also get similar kind of granulomatous inflammation. And unless we do the culture, we will not be able to differentiate. So this is very important. So here we, we did see uh, necrotizing granuloma on pathology and gene expert unfortunately was inconclusive because it was just trace and we are waiting for the culture report to come. Now second patient, a 65 year old male, known case of type 2 diabetes, came with fever, cough and weight loss and sputum evaluation was done being a diabetic and having cough, fever, weight loss, the commonest diagnosis would be TB, but sputum gene expert was negative. Then here, uh, because he was elderly man and he had got his uh, USG abdomen and CT scan done at his native place and also there could be a suspicious of uh, lymphoma needs to be ruled out. Now here on the CT scan, you can make out that there is this paratracheal lymph node, a big lymph node. Another lymph node you are seeing, is this is in subcarinal area. So it's a large lymph node and along with that, you are seeing cavitatory lesion in the parenchyma. So with this cavitatory lesion, diagnosis of tuberculosis was much more likely. 
but we did the bronchoscopy and here with the bronchoscopy we did endobronchial ultrasonography that is called ebus and did the uh, fine needle aspiration biopsy and aspiration both so here here in bal we got gene expert positive and it was rifa sensitive and uh, in ebus we saw non necrotizing granuloma so sometimes in tuberculosis also we can get non necrotizing granulomas so this patient was a case of drug sensitive tb now it is very uh, important for us clinician when we do our, when we are doing a you know invasive test it is better to collect sample from multiple areas and send it for multiple tests so that's important because we cannot repeat the test like bronchoscopy or ebus repeatedly so it's better to send the tissue also for culture as well as histopathology and ball sample for cytology as well as for uh, the microbiological evaluation and this is a third case a 30 year old female she presented with cervical lymph node it was biopsy proven tb and drug sensitivity proven on the gene expert earlier if she had a cervical node which we could biopsy it was very easy to biopsy but after three months of tb treatment also there was no clinical and radiological response so we repeated a ct scan test it showed multiple media cell lymph node and in ct abdomen it showed multiple abdominal lymph nodes and there was obstruction of the common bile duct and uh, she developed uh, jaundice uh, so the lymph node was 6 so biopsy of the abdominal lymph node was done so how non invasively you could do a biopsy a less invasive procedure so we did endoscopic ultrasound through the esophagus we did the biopsy the histopath uh, showed a necrotizing granuloma and gene expert again proved that this is a drug sensitive tb so these are three cases this is here you can see the x ray in this patient see this paratracheal region it is showing large paratracheal lymph so he she had paratracheal lymph nodes both left as well as right and this is the x ray which is done after 3 months and since it is not showing response we had to do the ct scan and repeat the test so these are three cases of tuberculosis that i had to share thank you thank you ma'am for those cases i think uh, i think what is most important point that you have said is that when you get the tissue please send it to for proper investigation in addition to pathology i think that's a very important lesson that uh, all of us if i if i permitted to say yes dr thing, saran please one, yes. one very important thing dr dalal has said and for that is very important for all the pathologists to do that the up front the drug sensitivity even in the national tuberculosis eradication program they said it whenever you are testing for anything tissue or anything for tuberculosis send it for cbnat for rifampicin and inf sensitivity So nowadays, for pathologists to diagnose tuberculosis is not a big thing. We have to give upfront to the clinician and sending the tissue to CBNAT or the gene export equivalent or any any platform to say that they, before the start of the, the, uh, treatment of ATD, clinician should have a report with them whether it is a rifampicin sensitive and INS sensitive or not. <coughs> Because that is the crux of the thing to for the whole of the tuberculosis treatment, and it is aligned with the national tuberculosis eradication program. So that I wanted to tell. This yes, is very important. Yes, very, very important point, sir. And yeah. see, generally, when a, a pulmonologist sends the sample, the pulmonologist is aware. But many times, you will get samples, extra pulmonary oh, yeah. sample from sur surgeons, and that's where you know when they they have low. pre uh, biopsy suspicion of tb they would end up sending the sample just for histopathology and they lost lost the opportunity to replace and this is still happening very commonly so as a pathologist when you talk to your uh, you know, surgical colleagues you have to make them very very aware that even if you have low suspicion of tuberculosis please do send the sample for gene expert and afp culture in the same setting thank you ma'am and any other points which is very important Okay. 
the in first initial three months, four months, the, even the lesion size can increase, despite being the drug sensitivity. And that is another very important point because of the so much necrosis of the drugs and in the invasion of the osmosis, the size of the lymph node tenderness they increase, and the clinician many times think that it is not as in your third case system. You have repeatedly done different. Uh, methodology of aspiration and doing and then finding again that is this is the thing which the pathologist should have to keep in mind that despite the treatment which is standard protocol with adequate compliance everything the size of the lymph node can increase in some of the cases so that point i can tell Yes. So iris, iris is very common and it's seen more in uh, lymph node TB, it's seen more commonly in serious TB and pleural TB. Yeah. Okay. Now we'll tell uh, Sudhir to take over the other cases. Yes, Sudhir, please share your screen. Yes, thanks. Ma'am, you can stop sharing the screen. Yeah. Yes, yes. Yeah, okay. Sudhir. I stopped the screen. Okay. Yes. Sudhir, you can share. Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can see. Yes. Go down to the case three or more. Case three. <laughs> who is uh, who is who will be taking the case three? Agam. Agam. Yes. yes, sir. Sir, middle-aged male presented to pulmonary medicine OPD with complaints of shortness of breath and fatigue since three months. Recently, he developed uh, blurring of vision and papillary skin lesions on extremities. Biopsy from lung for interpretation. Adam, I will not go to the next slide. By looking at the history, uh, yes, sir. What do you think? Uh, sir, it looks like an autoimmune disease, sir, involving multi-system. Why not uh, blurring of disseminated vision? Why you thought important? Sorry, sir. Why not a disseminated lesion, disseminated infectious lesion? Uh, Is there any possibility? Sir, uh, fever would. Uh... Fever can happen. Yes. Even in autoimmune disease, you will have fever. Fever, yes, Even sir. In disseminated infectious diseases, you will have fever. So, when the patient is having multiple lesions, why the clinician thought that I will take biopsy from the lung? Why not from the skin, you know? Again, that is the skin. Yes. Why not from the skin? I agree that there is a blood in the vision. Cannot take biopsy from the heart, uh, from the eye. Um, so, the, the chances of finding a granuloma might be higher in older okay. lesions. Because we are talking about granulomatous lesions, you think only about granuloma. That's great. Good. So, Agam, yes. I'll just ask you one thing. So, Professor Siddharth Dattagupta sir has beautifully. Seen you are very lucky to have sir on board and result is lecture. So, thing is, whenever you have a granuloma, think that you are a granuloma. Do you, how often do you see granuloma in a routine day to day life in, in your laboratory? How often do you see? Either sir, very often. Uh, how often? Maybe one to two cases per day? Yes, sir. Okay. All of us. So it's, yes. Thing is, the granulomatous lesions or diseases of any system, it is one of the most common, even in remote medical colleges or hospitals, wherever you will see one to two cases of granulomatous, right? Yes, How sir. often are you satisfied with your diagnosis once you see and report the granuloma? How often you are right? Think that, yes, I have seen, seen two cases today. All my two cases are 100% right, correct diagnosis, also correct diagnosis. How often do you feel like that? You will not follow? So why uh, I am telling you this is, see, identifying granuloma, pathologists should not be only limited to the slides. So it is a bridging field for both clinicians, 
immunology and the basic pathology. You have to identify the disease. Okay, you have to instead of clinicians, if they are having hundred differential diagnosis, it's your duty to narrow it to few differential diagnoses. Carry on further uh, special stains are necessary. Other investigation to come down to the diagnosis, if possible, you have to direct the clinicians for proper patient care and management. Right. So granuloma, right? See, granuloma. If you think, n number of diseases can have granuloma. Name any diseases. Somewhere yeah, or the yeah. other, they might show granuloma as infection. Right. So because in this patient he is a middle-aged male, I'll just go about. He had a presence of a uh, shortness of breath on clinical history. Right? Uh, so so that the history is probably long, so chances of disseminated infection is less likely. Fine. So why? Because he is having fatigue, shortness of breath, fatigue since three months. It's quite acute or subacute. Quite for a three months duration. If you are suffering, you also feel. You know, it's a long duration. So that's what the clinician thought to take biopsy from the lab. So we'll see what biopsy shows. Yeah. Okay. Sir. Point, Aga. So yes, sir. Whenever this such a thing happens, obviously he would have undergone a chest x-ray. Yes, yes, sir. And there must have been something in the chest x And of course, other investigation might have prompted for a lung biopsy. Okay, tell. So, one thing you should remember, Adam. So, whenever there is a shortness of breath and pulmonary uh, involvement, one, a routine x-ray and high-resolution CD of the chest is must no? to see the disease distribution and its severity. That is, after that, clinician thought something else, the, some diseases of the lung, so he took a biopsy. And this is the biopsy what you are asking. I want your description. Yes, sir. Sir, the section examine shows well formed, discrete, uh, naked granulomas along the lip. Try to identify the tissue first. Sir, uh, can show. Sorry, Divyanchu, there's some sound coming, no? Are you all background. background. Background sound is coming. Yes. I think, uh, okay, now it's gone. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Divyanchu, uh, can, can you see my arrow? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. What is this? So these are lymphatic channels, sir. Ah, uh, that's what I told you. You have to identify. I already told you that biopsy is taken from the lung. From the Right? What are these structures? Alveoli. These are all alveoli. No? These are each one thing, the hexagonal structures are alveoli. They are separated by interalveolar septum. And this part of the lung looks perfectly normal. You know? Perfectly normal. So first thing all of you should remember is try to identify the tissue first from where the biopsy has come. So if it is come from pulmonary, obviously you will know that it is from lung. But most of the time, but ma'am said it will be from surgery where they will not even write anything on the form. You have to assume. So identification as a resident, you have to identify the parent organ and tissue first. Fine. This is the lung. You are, are you uh, you are confirmed that it's a lung? Yes, sir. Do you see alveoli anywhere else in any other organ other than lung? No, sir. The alveolar structures. Okay. Then what do you see? Other it should be very careful. Supposing there is blood in those places, no? yes. don't mistake them for cavernous hemangiomas. Cavernous hemangiomas. Okay. It looks almost like that. Some, the new residents sometimes mistake. Okay. Yes. And one more important and thing. And in the edge, edge, edge yes. what is that? Edge? What is happening here? Can you describe this? Yes, sir. Oh, the pathology, what are you seeing here? Uh, sir, we are seeing well-formed, discrete, naked granulomas uh, along the periphery and just beneath the pleura, sir. Beneath the pleura. And here, they are discrete, very good. And, sir, in the next slide... Uh, no, no, I'm not going to next slide. Tell in this slide only. Sir, they are a naked granuloma, sir, without the lymphocytic collar. Yes, sir, surrounded by fibrosis, sir. 
lot of fibrosis. Is a, yes, there is a lamellated fibrosis, right? You want yes. to comment anything other than this and this magnification? Sir, um, uh, uh, sir, uh, punctured necrosis is also visible in uh, areas of uh, calcification, sir. Uh, sir, uh, uh, toward just beneath, yes, sir, uh, beneath the pleura, sir. Yes. Uh, all, yes, sir. This these one. These are all multinucleated giant cells. You know, these are a well-formed epithelial cell granuloma. You said discrete, located in the subpleural region and also somewhere in the alveolar parenchyma. You see. Lung parenchyma in the alveoli. Each granuloma, you said, they have poor lymphocyte cuffing. See, identify each and every component of it, right? And some of the granuloma, so majority of the granuloma, they show some kind of a lamellated fibrosis, which is present at the periphery. And do you see necrosis? Sir, you cannot make out at this magnification, you want to put higher magnification. Yes, sir. Okay. And Go to the next slide. Yes. Sir, here the granulomas are trying to coalesce, sir. Yes. Sir, yes. I'm Can you see that? Yes, sir. So this granuloma, I can easily separate this granuloma, this granuloma, and this granuloma. Yes, sir. Do you still call it as a confluent granuloma or discrete granuloma? Sir, they are trying to police, uh, sir. The conf, uh, I would say confluent granuloma, sir. Say granuloma. The confluent, okay. Next slide in higher magnification. Sir, uh, I thought Agam. that. Yes, sir. Agam. Are these granulomas uh, located near blood vessels or bronchi or just lying here there? Is there any peculiar distribution or they are just randomly present everywhere? Sir, along the uh, lymphatic channels and blood vessels, sir. How? Where is that? Where is the lymphatic? Can you see lymphatics and HND in lung? Clearly, can you make out? What structure is this? Sir? Yes? What other? Can you hear me? What structure is this? There is one Yes. But I'm not sure, sir. Right. So I'll tell you. You just have to think. You know, it is a round structure, tubular thing. It has yes, got a thick wall and few RBCs in the lumen. What structures it could be? Vessel, sir. Yes, it is a vessel. So you need to identify as a resident. You need to identify the two <laughs> structures. How to identify? <laughs> Know the histology must. So it is a vessel. There is a full granuloma here. And what is vast structure is this? So now, why do you say it is now? Uh, it's a lumen here. There are a few RBCs. Sir, uh, neurovascular bundle, I would say. No, why? Why narrow? Is it a narrow bundle? Narrow bundle or narrow, uh, narrow bundle or a vessel? So the, this is vessel and just above it there is a nerve, no, sir. So this is actually, if you think, the extension of the same vessel. You know? This vessel is continuing here. It is tangentially cut. Can you see the lumen? Yeah. Okay. It's a tangentially cut vessel. And where are these granulomas are located? The perivascular. Sir. What structure is this? Can you see my uh, pointer here? Again, there is. The cap. It is also a blood vessel. See the granulomas where they are located. Peri, uh, perivascular, sir. Perivascular location. So predominantly, the granulomas are perivascular 
different uh, vascular location and what are you seeing in the center of this? Sir, uh, sir, I thought it uh, to be a uh, calcified or punctured necrosis. Sir. In HND, whenever you have a calcific deposition, that will be bluish in color. Yes, sir. Either amorphous, nodular, bluish in color. Unless until you see that, don't comment that it is a calcification. Right? Identification of calcification, is it helpful for you to give a definite diagnosis in this case? Sorry, sir? Identification of calcification or observing calcification in this granuloma, will it be of help to give a definite diagnosis? Yes, sir. What? What If you see calcification, what do you think? If you don't see calcification, what do you think? See? Identification, sir, as I mentioned, this showman bodies, asteroid bodies, although they are present, showman bodies are lamellated calcification. It will not be of helpful in identifying or giving any definite diagnosis. They can be seen in n number of cases. So, for residents, all of you should remember, whenever there is a degeneration of any etiology, any infectious growth, diseases of chronic, long duration infectious diseases, where there is necrosis, collagen degeneration, they are intended to have calcium deposition. Right? So, identification of calcification is not helpful to give or come to a definite conclusion. Okay. That's all of you should remember. I'll go to the next slide. Okay. Describe where these granulomas are located. These are Perfect. These are interalveolar septae. You know, here, septae. One alveolar lying here. This is the interstitium. One more alveoli. And again, there is one granuloma here. So these granulomas are located in the interstitium. Alveolar interstitium. Right? By looking at it, see, there is one more granuloma here. And there is no necrosis. So whenever you see granuloma, one thing all of you should remember and you have to include in your report is whether there is a, in developing countries like India, granuloma if you are describing, mention whether the necrosis is there or not. It is an important negative finding. You have to include this in your report. Right? So what do you think? By looking at all the observation on this, what you want to do next? Yes, you found granuloma. There are multiple granulomas. Something that some of them are you said, becoming like confluent, no necrosis. What do you think, and what you, how you go about this kind of cases? Sir, I think it's a case of sarcoidosis, sir. You will give a definite diagnosis of sarcoidosis. Uh, sir, multi-system involvement, and sir. Um, so, what do you do next in this case? Sir, uh, if we can do a, sir, uh, there are various, sir, uh, CD4 to CD8 counts, uh, the ratio of in help in uh, diagnosing sarcoidosis. Sir. In bowel fluid? In bowel fluid, sir, yes. Sir. In this case, what you will do? We have a biopsy slide. Sir, uh, we can stain it with uh, uh, serum amyloid A, sir. Why? So it is uh, uh, used in uh, diagnosing sarcoidosis specifically, and we can see whenever you have a granuloma, the first thing you have to do is to exclude all the positive infectious diseases. Sir, then staining, sir. Certain staining and sir, pass do fungal exclusion. Yes, and pass, sir. You will do then anything else to confirm that these granulomas are sarcoid as they are. Diagnostic of health, yes, Gokul. 
the reticulin stain, reticulin risk. Yes. Reticulin. What do you expect in this patient? Reticulin risk grand omas are due to the sarcoidosis and reticulin deficient are mostly necrotizing grand omas in TBs. Do you see reticulin risk grand omas in tuberculosis? You can see. So these are just an additional features and so why I am highlighting this is in uh, this granulomas disease, especially lung is one, although you will see granuloma every day, the classical cases what we describe or what you study in the book is just a tip of an iceberg. Okay, most of the things you will not see the classical cases of tuberculosis a classical case of sarcoidosis so you have to have a multidisciplinary approach call the resident you will learn yourself get that history history talk to him about the clinical findings talk to him about what all diagnosis they have done what are investigations they have done so you can get i can give a good diagnosis so this has to develop each and every resident at your institute to resident resident discussion should develop right so one thing and identifying granuloma is not only thing that distribution of granuloma where they are located this is very important for you give a typical clues along with the history so history i mentioned this patient had a skin lesion and this patient had blood inflammation and on lung biopsy you have a discrete multiple non necrotizing lymphocyte poor granuloma with peripheral laminated type of fibrosis okay so this uh, after discussion with a clinician ophthalmologist here and the dermatologist with the pulmonologist you can come to a conclusion that it is a case of sarcoidosis so why i am telling you highlighting here is multidisciplinary approach all of you should although you think that the case is very simple but the diagnosis can change if you have a proper multidisciplinary approach. Right? Yeah. So have to yes, sir. No, no, no. Can I, ask I something? just, I just yes. wanted to tell you, you know, you see, the first two cases we discussed was just a general thing, you know. Now it is organ specific, most of them. So you have to identify the organ, the stepwise method. Identify the organ, identify the location of the organ and how, how, the, how it is going about. And what he said was, invariably you have to do a clinical pathological correlation. They may do a serum ACE level, the HRCT findings would have been specific and so on and so forth. There are several things. MAM will, I'm sure, add to all the clinical things. Eh? Yeah. So that is how we yes, should do Yes, ma'am. Okay. Yes. Yeah, I have a case of sarcoidosis and CT scan. You want me to show now? Yes, you can. You can show it now. I just uh, stop. And then you'll talk about some of the other different things. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So yes, uh, this is a very important point I want to bring about. Uh, first, let me show the case, and then I will yes, tell. Sir. So, 35-year-old male. History of malaise, occasional fever, dry cough, and dyspnea on exertion, which were progressing. Uh, so he had skin lesion, which was suggestive of uh, uh, edema nodosum. So we did his uh, CT scan, and uh, you can see here in the CT scan, you are seeing multiple random nodules, and the distribution, some of the very special nodules, which is quite classical of sarcoidosis. And you are seeing multiple reticular opacities here, the septal thickening you are seeing, and randomly distributed nodules. You can see here, and also here the hilar lymph nodes are enlarged. You can see these are the hilar nodes. And uh, yeah, this is a media channel window. You can see here this is a big subcarinal node. This is a hilar node. 
So classically, uh, compared to tuberculosis and sarcoidosis, you will have nodes which are more, you know, extensive involvement, along with these kind of parenchymal nodules and absence of necrosis. But again, this is not always there. Sometimes, uh, you know, uh, growing nodes can show area which is on CT scan appears like a necrosis. Histopathologically, you may be able to differentiate, but radiologically, that necrosis may not be, you may not be able to differentiate. And uh, we did the, we did the bronchoscopy uh, in this patient. And here we combined bronchoscopy with EBUS, which is endobronchial ultrasound. And even the endobronchial mucosa had a typical appearance of uh, sarcoid, uh, you know, sarcoid uh, involvement. So we did biopsy from the uh, endobronchial tissues. We did biopsy from the transbronchial tissue, transbronchial lung biopsy. And we did EBUS uh, lymph node sampling also. And all three uh, things did show us uh, non-necrotizing granuloma. But here I would like to say that even for a pathologist to confidently say that this tuberculosis can be ruled out, it's very difficult. Sometimes in early stages of TB, we may get nodules, uh, I mean, we, we get granuloma which may not be necrotizing. So we always have to wait for the culture report to come. So I had a case which was sent to me by a cardiologist. She had cardiomyopathy, which was quite suggestive of sarcoid cardiomyopathy. She was a diabetic, uncontrolled diabetes. She had a cervical node and the biopsy was done. This biopsy was very confidently reported by the pathologist and non-necrotizing granuloma suggestive of sarcoid. But I was not very comfortable because there was some history of weight loss. And in diabetic, sometimes we may not get classical fever. Mantus was done when Mantus was positive. So I was not very confident of starting this patient on steroid. So I started steroid along with anti tuberculous treatment, awaiting the culture report. And after six weeks, the culture came positive. And on that culture, we showed that this was a drug resistant TB. So had I been, I know, had the clinician or pathologist been very confident of sarcoidosis as a diagnosis and put this patient just on steroid without anti tb treatment, it would have been disaster. So this is very important. And also very common, I mean, not very uncommonly, we see tuberculosis and sarcoid existing together. Well, one of the theory is sarcoid being a thread where antigen could be tuberculous antigen. So we see coexistence of tuberculosis and sarcoidosis also. So this when you were reporting a patient of uh, sarcoid looking granuloma. So, interacting with your clinicians is very, very important in this situation. This is yeah, and, and here again, the uh, additional information that we got on transbronchial biopsy that there was evidence of fibrosis and architectural distortion also. So this gives me additional info that sarcoid is progressive and is already gone into fibrotic state. One important question can I ask and have a yeah, yeah. Uh, How many times do we, uh, in sarcoid the peripheral uh, 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 pleural space they have their reticular cavities uh, and then the biopsy from the open biopsy is done as Dr. Sudhir was uh, showing you, showing the sarcoid. Because sarcoid, what we have read it is conventionally a paratracheal, para aortic, a large, uh, big, big node, and then have uh, some uh, very uh, major bronchus, some reticular cavities done. So, can you highlight the importance of classical presentation of the sarcoid? Uh, from the uh, just X-ray CT point, and then the multiple uh, uh, shadows to this, where the sub sub plural biopsies are going to use. Because main main site of biopsies are the uh, EBUS or the uh -huh. FNA or whatever from the that. That's what, what what I remember. So please just yes, clarify those points. <laughs> Yes. So actually, 
pleural effusion and pleural involvement is not so common in sarcoidosis we say few cases we have seen which uh, you know patient with diagnosed sarcoidosis or patient presenting with uh, pleural effusion recurrent pleural effusion and all our tests for gene expert ab culture all come negative and then we do pleural thoracoscopic pleural biopsy we we find uh, granulomas for i mean sarcoidosis uh, presenting with pleural effusion in our practice is much less common much less common um, uh, when you uh, come across with a classical case of pulmonary sarcoidosis with serum ace levels elevated calcium levels ele elevated ada is in case of ada is less and non to is negative do you still go for biopsy see in case of sarcoid we would always like to confirm the diagnosis and send the tissue for culture because i mean i mean because there is there are such close mimics both the, the, i remember one of our uh, teachers uh, many years back used to tell us a sarcoid and tuberculosis is like that old movie sita and geeta they look so so alike including the system that they affect that we would not like to treat these patients without confirming the diagnosis and uh, all the tests the diagnostic yield of for sarcoidosis is pretty high even in a bronchoscopy transbronchial biopsy or even uh, lymph node biopsy so so we would like to usually go for the tissue confirmation and because ace level again can be non specific we see ace level being high in tuberculosis cases sometimes ada levels coming low in pleural effusion so all these are not very specific findings and we would like to always confirm with a biohistopathology and culture uh, this is just a message for the residents so whenever the clinician uh, thinks that it is a case of pulmonary tuberculosis or pulmonary sarcoidosis the what biopsy you will receive here is a uh, bronchial biopsy we have to see the submucosal location of this non k shaped granulomas one thing in addition we will have transbronchial lung biopsy where you will see tiny granulomas as sir said arranged along the lymphomuscular location so this is the two biopsy and in addition if the patient is having a venous Plus FNAC all specific also just to get the non-necrotizing granulomas. So these are the three important specimens we do get in sarcoidosis. In case cytology, we may get a more fluid analysis also. So that is for residents must understand that the treatment is two different. Yes, between tuberculosis and tuberculosis, and lot of things are at stake. So therefore, you have to try to. As is, Sudhi said initially, narrow down the come to a, as close a diagnosis as possible and help the clinician. Absolutely. With this, yes. Before we go to add, I need to address the question that there are six more cases that we have to deal with now. So, okay, we'll we'll go faster, please. So these are the classic five. So these are the. Okay. So there, there's the, one thing. Two people have said, why not it is Wegner? You know, it's you can tell them. Uh, actually, Wegner's no. Uh, there'll be lot of neutrophils. The necrosis is little more bluish. You will not get like this uh, very commonly. Like in sarcoid, very rarely it looks like this. So, and it is at, uh, located at the periphery of the vessel, not destroying the vessels. That is to say, it is vasculitis. The inflammation should destroy the vessel wall. And plus, you will get fibrinoid necrosis, fibrinoid necrosis. neutrophils, and other things. Yes. Are. Even in sarcoid, you may see lymphocytic vasculitis also. But the necrosis of the vessel wall is not. So these are the reticulin rich granulomas that are already said. Go we'll ahead. And on contrary, if you have tuberculosis, they are reticulin poor granulomas, right? So if you see, there are few cases. This patient. Uh, male presented with this tiny papule on just behind the ear, even on the forehead. The biopsy has been taken from this, and it shows this multiple 
discrete, well-formed, non-necrotizing <laughs> epithelial cell granulomas. All of them are reticulin rich. Okay. So when you see this kind of granuloma with the fibrosis at the periphery, naked granuloma, so it is a case of cutaneous sarcoidosis. Even one third to one fourth of pulmonary sarcoid patients, they may have cutaneous lesions. So this is asteroid bodies, Schaumann bodies. This is not specific. If you identify, it's well and good. Okay, uh, sir, can we uh, go up because we have to finish, shall we? You, you, uh, you, you are mute, sir. Quickly show this, just okay. to... So why I am highlighting here is the approach to this granuloma should be a very diligent. It's not like as we think. The distribution and excluding all the possible causes, etiology of the granuloma is important. See, this patient is presented with recurrent onsets of mucosal and uh, edema from past uh, one year. It's all yeah. enough. Biopsy has been taken in this from the lip. If you see that, there are multiple granulomas. One granuloma here, tiny granuloma here, a lot of chronic inflammation, and even the inflammation is going deep and hit the perioral musculature, skeletal muscles, and there is a non necrotizing granuloma. So, in this kind of, when you have a clinical picture, along with the other uh, support investigations, this will fall into orofacial granulomatosis. It is not tuberculosis or it is not archidosis. So that's why the importance of multidisciplinary approach in the granulomas are very, very important. Okay. Again, I will not show this. I'll show this. Can anyone describe fast? What are you seeing in this? Agar, see. Again, there are tiny cells and inform granuloma gametes. This is the granulomatous inflammation, and there is dense lymphocyte coupling. No necrosis. Now, see what granulomas, where they are located, what they are causing. They are destroying the rectal and they are present in the location. Okay, so when you have this kind of appearance, you are always there without any doubt to think of that you are dealing with depression. Okay, so when you see this patient, this is the patient who presented with the annular rash with hypopigmented area and the clinical diagnosis was BT Hansen. Again, it is a granuloma, non but see what is causing its location, very vascular location, neural neurovascular body location. Destruction of the erectile muscle that will be of help for us to diagnose the deficit. Always we will do body body in this stage. You see this deep granuloma are causing destruction of the erectile muscle. See this guy? This granuloma causing damage to the erectile muscle. Whenever you see like this, you think that I'm dealing with deficit. Again, it is one more case. Here it is a nerve fragment. Nerve. Full nerve, there is dense inflammation. Again, you are seeing granuloma in the nerve. This patient he came with pure neurotic Hansen's. Nerve surgery was done. Neural inflammation with the granuloma. Again, it is the feature of leprosy. So, you should know the location of these granulomas. It is important. Uh, this, you know, this is a single tiny subcutaneous nodule. It is excised. And they said that spindle cell granuloma like lesions. Whenever you have this, this with interspersed foamy histocyte, just do air stains and you see this blow away of the with high vascular index. It is a histioid leprosy. Importance of these are infectious granulomas. And see this, this patient had a big plaque on his forearm. And there is necrobiosis in the center. Biopsy has taken. Can anyone describe this first? Any resident? This is happening. Which is located? Which structure is this? Agar? Gokul, Gokul, Gokul. The downloads are located up against the region. Yes. There is. See, there is a very big granuloma, right? Very big granuloma. 
That's why they are called as blue granuloma. Even in HND, in Mucin, you can see there is a bluish hue in the center of these granulomas. That can be demonstrated very well by doing special stains, AB pass. So hence, are you agree that it is a blue granuloma? So if you know the clinical history of this patient, if you know the clinical appearance of the lesion, the diagnosis is very simple, not to any doubt. Granuloma annulare. Right? So that's why the multidisciplinary approach and is very important. <coughs> this is again one more case. Can you see local? Same thing. There is a lot of collagen. These are all wavy collagen bundles which are fragmented. There is bluish material as per said is here. This whole area is totally and collagen degeneration. And there is a dysphagmatic arrangement surrounding this collagen degeneration. What do you think? Rheumatoid parasite. Rheumatoid. This is how you should operate. See this? Even in the center, this collagen degeneration, necrobiotic degeneration. And here you have palisaded epithelial dysphagmatic. Even you see multiple giant cells. If the patient is having a joint pain, no need to think of anything. You know? That's what it makes the thing treatment and diagnosis very simple. If we just follow the resident, all of you, I request all of you, resident from the first year, make a habit of calling. That's what we learned from Dr. Siddhartha Dr. Gupta sir. Call up the clinician, uh, resident, resident clinician, develop the bond. Will learn many clinical scenario of the disease. So just develop this habit in all. Again, if you see this, the clinical presentation is a small, tiny tapules on the skin. Biopsy has been taken and it shows granuloma located in the papillary duct. Have any? If you say this has tuberculosis or leprosy, clinicians will not send any sample to you from the tumor. Clinical clinician pathologist, the classical presentation is lichen nitidus. Lichen nitidus. You know, this is non infectious granuloma. They know it is lichen nitidus. And the pathology, you know the clinical picture, presence of granuloma, whether well formed, 
or ill form a tiny histiocytic collections in the tip of the thermal papillae with without giant cells you can call it as acanitidis and your diagnosis will be final so you know the importance of clinical pathological coordination right and can you see what is this agam explain sir uh, so there is lot of uh, foamy histocytes are present uh, uh, in the sub epidermal and uh, in the uh, uh, papillary dermis sir yes. this is yes this is the papillary dermis and this we call it as a reticular dermis so you see globules diffuse pan dermal infiltration of foamy histocytes can you see the central located nucleus and they are foamy histocytes and if you search for it you will find these kind of cells what are these cells sir said nucleus in the center and there is vacuation at the periphery proton proton joint cells your diagnosis will be xanthogram xanthogram yes now you know the importance of accompany cells the location of the granuloma and their clinical appearance clinical features are very much important each and every case although you think that it is simple but when you have a clinical picture your diagnosis can change right next we'll go to case number 4 i think sir will take this sir read any one please Uh, just uh, 39 year old male presented with complaints of uh, chronic diarrhea so i'll stop sharing sir okay stop okay, i'll stop sharing you stop yes yeah. see yes yes it's there no <laughs> Okay. Yeah. Who who is taking the case? Um, you take. Huh? Hello. Okay. Ah, go for it. It's a thirty-nine year old male with yeah. complaints of chronic diarrhea, abdominal pain, and blood in stools. Uh, recently developed mouth mouth ulcers. Coronary biopsy for interpretation. Anything you can clinically. सर इनफ्लेमेटरी बावल नॉन स्पेसिफिक एंड आल्सो आल्सो पॉइंटिंग बायोप्सी Uh, here the strips are more or less preserved. The architecture is preserved in the initial sections, and uh, in that uh, third section we can see there is uh, in, uh, towards deeper tissue there is uh, some uh, necrosis kind of uh, changes are happening. Okay. And in this uh, in this tissue we see one thing. Here there is necrosis. Here there is hardly any inflammation, no? Yeah. Okay. There might be other ones. Here there is inflammation more. Here it is less. Okay. Now we'll go to the next one. Yeah. In this section also, crypt crypt architecture is preserved. But uh, in the uh, in between the crypts, we can see some uh, isnobilic infiltrates. and this one the infiltrates also and in the uh, third section we can see uh, discrete uh, endocrine granuloma uh, with uh, lanthanide kind uh, types of giant cells epithelioid cells okay and these areas mm. this one Uh, lymph, 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 lymph,
this very small granuloma is it granuloma yes sir this is a better one which is the larger one that is granuloma yes okay so what is your diagnosis any differential uh, diagnosis uh, i would like to say colitis mm -hmm. and granuloma is colitis uh. and uh, my main differential is crohn's uh, disease and uh, abdominal tuber uh, tuberculosis and uh, central tuberculosis and i would like to do uh, afp screen in that uh, section ियन to send in different containers biopsies from different regions so rectal biopsy then sigmoid colon descending colon transverse colon ascending colon and cecum and they may do the elements you have to examine each of these regions separately because histologically and endoscopically they may be different if the if the inflammation if all the biopsies from the rectum onwards going proximally are showing inflammation it's likely to be ulcerative colitis if it is patchy it is likely to be crohn's or tuberculosis okay so this is very important and in our country you have to exclude that so that is one thing you have to ask i want to see biopsies from other areas or these are the only ones okay so and of course for crohn's everybody agrees if you see a granuloma you are more likely to be right but the problem is just like in sarcoidosis for pulmonologists in our country <coughs> gastroenterologists the problem is differential diagnosis of tuberculosis both of them look almost alike so that is one very important thing please remember if you have tangentially cut strips they may look like a small granuloma But you see, but you will find the nuclei are similar to these nuclei, right? If you do a mucin stain, you will find mucin. So you must be very careful. This is not a granuloma. Then granuloma is associated if the crypt is destroyed. You see, there will be mucin excavation and all that. So there might be a granulomatous inflammation. That is not counted as a Crohn's granuloma. The other thing is. if the granulomas are large and confluent see this is a confluent granuloma so then it is more likely to be tuberculosis if there is necrosis more likely to be tuberculosis if the lymph nodes are involved more likely to be tuberculosis this is a large sub small submucosal granuloma this you can get also in the in crohn's disease see small ones trying to become confluent okay these are small granuloma so what is a small granuloma a small granuloma is a granuloma less than two crypts in width for example if a granuloma is smaller than these two combined if it is so small then it is a small granuloma or a micro granuloma if it is larger than this it's a big granuloma bigger granulomas tb are more likely in tb smaller granulomas more likely people have counted the number of epithelial cells they say if it is more than 25 epithelial cells or more than 1 micron then it is a large granuloma okay so micro granulomas are more common so typically they are little loose not as tight as sarcoid non necrotizing non confluent okay so more number of cells more likely to find okay did this has been studied more biopsies more section you are likely to find others you will call it ulcerative colitis or some other thing. if the inflammation is discontinuous see two different fragments no inflammation inflammation more likely to be <laughs> 
So when you use the term focal increase in inflammation, it means normal background cellularity with little increase in these inflammatory cells. Patchy means increased background cellularity with focal small areas of increase in inflammatory cells. So this is focal inflammation, typical of the See, background cellularity is normal with the increase. This you get in clones. This is patchy inflammation. You can get in a lot of conditions. Full background cellularity increase. This. More than two lymphoid follicles, if you are finding, per millimeter of biopsy, it is abnormal. Subnutrient inflammation, more likely to be Crohn's or TB than ulcerative colitis. So what is an aphthous ulcer? Anyone? Quick. Okay. See, the word aphthous means set on fire or to inflame. And the Hippocrates described it mainly for mouth ulcers. Okay. In colon for Crohn's disease and all, aphthous ulcer is ulceration over a lymphoid follicle. That is what is an aphthous ulcer. You get to take this discontinuous architectural abnormalities and discontinuous inflammation and focal cryptitis if you get any two more likely to be Crohn's. Inflammation near ileocecal region more likely to be TB. Inflammation away from ileocecal region more likely to be Crohn's. AFB is absent. TB, unfortunately, you can get AFB positive in only 5% of cases. But large granulomas, more granulomas, more likely to be TB. So this is a study and all of them are similar wherever we have studied it. So caseation necrosis, more sensitive for TB. Contract granulomas, more sensitive for TB. Ulcers lined by epithelial cells, more sensitive for TB. Okay. Then I can do AFB and other things. AFB positivity in TB is varies from 2% to 30%. Culture positivity is more, it can be as high as 50 percent. Then of course you can do the PCR and other things. So you have to compare the endoscopic histological features. If both are typical, then you can treat as Crohn's or TB. One is typical, one is suggestive, then clinician takes a call. But if the changes are not typical, then a follow-up is done. Phase 5. Yes. Uh, can I please. say something, sir? Yes, Before yes, please. One important point is when the patient of an ulcerative colitis is on treatment and he is responding to a very good uh, extent, then the inflammation, everything is down and he is recovering with the mere maintenance of architectural pattern. And along that, is, there is a script granuloma. Yes, you see, if it is a known case of ulcerative colitis, then of course you have to take the other features into account. But for the first time if it comes, then it becomes difficult. Then you have to see whether the inflammation is continuous starting from the rectum or it is patchy and so on and so forth, then only. But mistakes have been done, one has been treated for the other and later on only when the disease progresses, the clinician and the pathologist will sit together and find out that this is done. Yes. Thank you. Because script associated dilemmas are many times uh, are in ulcerative colitis and that is the biggest uh, yes, uh, problem yes. of that. It's yes, very nice. Sir. Okay. Sudhir? Yes, sir. Next, who is going to take case number five? I think uh, oh, a lady is there, no? Prakish. Uh, 
Yes. 21 year old male with sudden history of death. The sections from the lung were taken for interpretation. Sudhir, sir, have you shared your screen? Yes, I shared my screen, sir. Can you see, sir? Okay, okay. Yes, yeah. sir, visible. Yeah, yeah, visible. <laughs> yes. Uh, young male. 21 year old yes. male with uh, sudden death history. The sections were taken from the lung for interpretation. Why this 21 year old healthy male will have sudden death? Can we explain what is the reason? If you think there are many reasons, yes. Anything, either cardiovascular sudden death is most common. Cardiovascular. Yes. Let's see. We have taken multiple sections from all the organs. This organ showed a classical histopathological features that made us to think and take further history. Right? Observe which uh, which organ is this? Oh, this is a section of lung. Why do you say this lung? Fast. So we can see the alveoli here and the bronchial epithelium. Yes, so this is very classical alveoli, and there is a bronchus here, bronchus bronchial, and bronchial associated blood vessels. Fine. Next, your observation. So I can see two granulomas here, the second section. Okay, one and two. Where are they located? Sir, so located um, between the alveoli. Uh, you, you mean to say somewhere in the alveolar interstitium? Yeah, interstitium, sir. Can you make out necrosis or not at this magnification? Sorry, sir. Are you able to identify necrosis or not? No, sir. Oh, we'll go to the next uh, slide. Yes, so there, sir. So there, sir. You know, many people have asked. How do you differentiate interstitial granulomas from intraalveolar ones? Intraalveolar. So, interstitial granulomas mean the granulomas present in the alveolar interstitium. So, see this. This is the interalveolar septum, right? All of you can see. There is one alveolar here, one alveolar here. If you find granuloma here, okay, this is the interstitial granuloma. Interalveolar granuloma. Intraalveolar granuloma means you see granuloma within the alveolar lumen. Understand? So just like a hot top lung disease, all those things you see intraalveolar granuloma. And interstitial granuloma within the alveolar interstitial this space most commonly because it is the space where you have lymphovascular structures. Sarcoidosis will be the main differentials. Understood? Okay, yes. I'll go to next slide. Identify. And let's see your observation. So why I'm highlighting is granuloma component, structure, and their location is very important. Right. Again, there are seeing. Yes. So I can see. Uh, uh, I can see granuloma. Right. Um, Here, one so granuloma. Yes. Okay, there are um, again granuloma. For what structure is this in the fourth picture? Columnar Yes, a columnar epithelium. So this is the bronchus. Yes, and where are the granulomas are located? On either so side of the bronchus, it yes, is causing sir. compression on the bronchus. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. So there are, are there any uh, peripheral demarcation in these granulomas? Yes, sir. There is fibrosis. Um, yes, I mean, fibroblast are there. Can you still make out where the granulomas are located? Yes, sir. Yes. Where? See uh, this one. This is the third picture. What are these structures? Are these any secretions? Some kind of a foreign material. Foreign material, foreign material that is eliciting granulomatous inflammation. Yes, After sir. any doubt till now, where this granuloma located? Third one, and even if you see the fourth granuloma, what structure is this? Fourth one, is, please see carefully. Yes, yeah, see carefully. I'll just highlight the structure. So I'll just trace. Can you see my arrow? <coughs> see this? What structure is this? Which has got smooth muscle in their wall. Again, there is 
Yes. What is this? Someone said that the light is not moving. One second. These lights are not moving? Not moving, yeah. No, no, no. Can you see these four pictures? Four pictures, yeah. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So this is the arrow. So you can see what structure it is, which has got smooth muscle in the form and maintains the RBCs in the lumen. Blood pressure. Blood pressure. This majority of these blood lomas, they are present within the blood vessel lumen causing luminal occlusion. Agree? Yes, sir. So what can you think? In 21-year-old man, presented with multiple granulomas, presented within the vessels, some of them are in the interstitial location, they have a foreign material, some structures, that is eliciting granulomatous inflammation. Can it be pulmonary embolism? Pulmonary embolism. Let's see. Again, there are many vessels that I am highlighting here. Can you see? You can see you can make out some part of the vessel wall and adjacent lung parenchyma showing what? What is this eosinophilic structure accumulated in the alveolar lumen? Pulmonary edema. Yes, pulmonary edema. Pulmonary, pulmonary hemorrhage. <coughs> pulmonary edema. Associated pulmonary hemorrhage and edema. Right? Yes. And even if you see under high power, there are some polarizable crystalline like that. What is this? Why they are located within the IV drug abuse? Yes. So very good. This very good. So who told this? Gokul. Gokul. Excellent. So whenever the thing is, whenever you observe this kind of granulomas, predominantly leading to Vascular emboli, giant cell reaction, vague granulomatous inflammation associated with pulmonary edema. So, in this patient, I'll tell you, each and every slide and almost 95% of the blood vessels were occluded by this granulomatous reaction. When we asked the history, he was a heavy drug abuser and recently he mixed many drugs, many powdered drugs. And if some of them are oil based, some of them are water dissolvable. He mixed in water, he injected in the vein. So, this is all because of this IV drug abuser. You should always think the history will solve your problem. Sometimes, right? IV drug abuser. Sometimes, no, the IV drug abusers, uh, talc is very common. Talc yes. is they mix with this one. Huh? There is a bluish material sometimes you get. They are some of the other experience which are. You know, solvents which are added with the drugs. There are some uh, polymers and other things that they So this is invariably polarized and you will find it. Yes. See this? All the blood vessels are flooded with this foreign body granulomatous reaction. Is there any differential diagnosis? If you don't ask history, you will have many differential diagnoses. If the history is straight, he is a heavy intravenous drug abuser. Is there any differential diagnosis in this case? So, as such said, polarize, polarizable material, if you can do polarized microscopy, you can try to identify the polarizable material. So he was an extensive pulmonary vascular emboli with foreign body granulomatous inflammation with associated pulmonary edema and even pulmonary hemorrhage. Okay, case number six. Sir, sir, this cannot be possible with only one bout of... Uh... No, he was heavy, heavy long-term addicted intravenous abuser. Not one so even for giant cells of foreign body to generate, you know, granuloma, you need to have at least one to two months to develop granuloma, giant cell reaction. It was a chronic case. Next, we will take case number six first. Those who have not taken, you can just read. Everybody is taking one, no? Everybody is taking one, each one. 
सुधीर यू कैन डिस्क्राइब वन बाय वन बिकॉज टाइम टाइम इज दस middle aged male presented with a history of gradual onset of shortness of breath tiredness and weight loss in few years symptoms gets progressively worse over time on examination prominent clumping of the fingers were observed and lung sections were the clinical history suggests that there is predominantly lung involvement and lung biopsy they have taken acha okay, all of you have taken at least one case no yes sir okay, sir Okay. If you are interested, you are most welcome. Yes. If you want to, anyone wants to describe the findings, it's more than sufficient. Anyone volunteer to describe the findings? Okay. Sir, it looks like uh, uh, sir. Uh, yes. Very good. Section from lung. Yes. Because there is bronchus here, associated vessels here. And the normal lung parenchyma, which we saw in previous cases, can you make out the alveoli? Yes, that means alveoli. There is this severe destruction of the lung parenchyma. The alveoli, the normal alveolar structures, are already distorted, and somewhere you will see some emphysematous changes, lot of fibrosis, and distortion of the normal alveolar structures. Right? Agree with me? Why there is destruction? The cause of destruction is a lot of fibrosis. Fibrosis. Is fibrosis. There is patchy chronic inflammation. Somewhere it is located in the peripronchial location. These are all anthropotic pigment deposition. And see this? There is a distance between this alveoli and this alveoli. They are increased. Interstitial fibrosis. So whenever you have a prominent interstitial fibrosis it hampers the oxygen saturation the patient will present with hypoxemia easy tiredness low blood oxygen level so on the contrary they will also have increased blood carbon dioxide levels okay so these are, that's why these patients will develop a easy fatigability and shortness of breath tachypnea episodes let's go to higher power the same thing even if you see the blood vessels blood vessels are also thickened so whenever you see thickened blood vessels it is again an indirect indicator that the inflammation or inflammatory disease body is there it is chronic disease it causes the thickening of the blood vessels it can be observed in pulmonary hypertension okay and there is one bronchi here one bronchi here so you will not expect so many bronchioles which are lying adjacent to each other in the lung if you see the histology right So, sir, uh, why can't be uh, this be lambertosis in a chronic disease like this? Yes, yeah, very good observation. See, see this. Is there actually observe some part is lined by the alveoli, but mm -hmm. other part they are lined by respiratory epithelium. So these are the normal alveoli, which have in which the wall is replaced by respiratory epithelium. <laughs> this we call it as lambertosis that we see in. Usual interstitial pneumonia. That is one example. Any chronic uh, infection. Idiopathic pulmonary. Any chronic lung diseases you may have this kind of infection. These are called, also called as bronchialization of the alveoli. Bronchial metaplasia. Whenever you have a bronchialization, again it interferes with oxygen saturation. That all of it is there. Whenever the epithelium is single layer, it helps in the oxygen saturation. Oxygen diffusion. When the alveoli is thickened, instead of flattened, it will become columnar. Along with interstitial fibrosis, both together will hamper the oxygen saturation. Right? Any doubts till now? No. Yes. Okay. See this again. As you rightly said, there is lambertosis, there is interstitial inflammation, and there is thickened blood vessels, peribronchial chronic inflammation. Peribronchial chronic inflammation is again important finding for the diagnosis, and the presence of lot of fibrosis and alveolar destruction that indicates that it is a chronic lung disease. So here till now there is a chronic lung disease with peribronchial inflammation. There are the two observations they have done, and even if you see there is mucus plug formation also. 
that is impairing the mucus clearance again complication thick worn blood vessels again can you see this there is bronchial uh, this is the bronchi where there is proliferation of myofibroblasts here that i will show you in the next slides chronic lung disease fibrosing peribronchial inflammation alveolar destruction mucus plug accumulation in the alveoli so whenever you have a mucus plug stagnation in the pulmonary pathway these are the risk sources for a secondary bacterial infection these patients will come for recurrent pulmonary infections recurrent pneumonia right observation and the important thing is we are finding some kind of this granuloma either within the alveoli some of them are present in the interstitial okay and this is the alveoli showing the prominent clump alveolar lining epithelium it is nothing but hyperplasia of type, type 2 pneumocytes so whenever you see hyperplasia of type 2 pneumocytes that indicates that there is an alveolar injury and it is undergoing for reparative process right and if you see granuloma they have cholesterol cleft in the granuloma can you make out the diagnosis of this magnification with these findings see again patchy chronic inflammation alveolar destruction mucus thickened blood vessels vague multinucleated giant cells can you see here in the interstitium and also in the inter alveolar lumen with the cholesterol clefts if you observe these things it will be easy for you to diagnose this case tub lung no heart tub lung you know It is uh, usually you see tiny, very. We do not show that much of fibrosis. Where ill-formed granulomas within the alveolar lumen. The hyper. The hypersensitivity pneumonitis. Hypersensitivity pneumonia. Yes, that is a very good. What stage of hypersensitivity pneumonitis? Can you see this? Even in advanced stage, sir, honeycombing is present. Sir. Correct. So whenever you see alveolar destruction, not fibrosis. Such chronic inflammation is almost going towards the end stage fibrotic lung disease. So here it is good enough we identify the giant cells. If you don't identify giant cells, you cannot. It is not possible for any pathologist when the disease is in the end stage, end stage fibrotic diffuse fibrotic lung disease. Not possible to see why fibrosis from where the what is the etiology of fibrosis in this lung disease. In this, we identified multinucleated giant cells, cholesterol clefts, and peripheral inflammation that led us to think that it is a hypersensitivity pneumonia. Even if you observe these cases, you do see mason-like borders in the fibroblastic proliferation here. and there is fibroblastic proliferation here within the alveolar pushing towards the alve in, inside the alveolar lumen there is fibroblastic proliferation within the bronchial wall if it is more it occludes the bronchial lumen then we call it as bronchiolitis obliterans right if the same the blood it occludes the alveolar lumen we call it as So we call it as organizing pneumonia. No, organizing pneumonia. Okay, so all these features you can see when you have a chronic diagnosis was right, and even if you see that sometimes you see smooth muscle metaplasia also in the interstitium, that again indicates its chronicity of the lesion. Sudhir, uh, uh, so sir, so the, you know if the Yeah. You saw the fibrosis pushing the bronchial mucus. Yes, you find granulomas pushing the uh, bronchial mucus. Think of hypersensitivity. Correct. That is one feature. Yeah. This is the patient trichome stage. Yeah. Just demonstrate the fibrosis. Can you see? There is a distance between one alveoli and another alveoli is so much. Can you think of diffusion in the patient? No. So, what would be the treatment of choice in this? If you see this kind of a biopsy, are there any medical line of management? Lung transplantation. Only the choice is lung transplantation, and actually, it is a case of lung transplantation. See, you know, 
this is equivalent to cirrhosis of the lung. Yes. You cannot do anything. It's all fibrous. There's uh, no way the airway is spread. Uh, this is the excised lung of that plant. Excised lung, in front, this central part is unfixed. Can you see this? There is some cystic, cystic dilated structures, nodularity. Mm -hmm. There is uninvolved lung parenchyma in between, multi lobar involvement, peribronchial location. All those features like, is a case of hypersensitivity pneumonitis. He was a case of hypersensitivity pneumonitis. Yes, progress toward yes. Can we call it temporal heterogeneity in this? Uh, if you want to call, you can call in many cases, but certain terminologies you have to be limited to a certain disease. You should not use those terminologies in other diseases. When the clinical setup and radiological setup is in case of uh, either non specific interstitial pneumonia or idiopathic interstitial pneumonia, then it's your duty to describe either temporal heterogeneity or spatial heterogeneity. Those terminal is better to keep restricted to certain diseases. Although it might meaning may be the same, but you should not use in case of hypersensitivity pneumonitis. One thing again I would like to highlight is highlight is in chronic hypersensitivity pneumonitis, even you do see NSIP features, you do see focal areas of dual features, idiopathic interstitial pneumonia, you do see bronchiolitis obliterans or organizing pneumonia, all type of patterns you may see in end-stage lung diseases, right? That is a good question, yes. Uh, can I say something about it? Yes, yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, how how uh, if it, only the biopsies has come and no uh, uh, radiological features, the uh, importance of the uh, um, uh, localized bronchial cases and the same uh, changes that, that you are showing, uh, is, is there are much more things that we can dissect it out how to differentiate oh, yeah. localized bronchial cases because the tissue will have a same way of reaction. Uh, yes, you yeah, are different. So this has to be as I told the localized bronchial cases is most commonly you have some kind of an obstructive etiology. Obstructive etiology they do under this patient they do undergo bronchoscopic examinations and. If not possible, they will dissect that part of the lobe. So there, the predominantly the bronchioles uh, wall shows dense inflammation with dilated, irreversible dilated with mucus plugs involved. But here, the alveoli, they are also distorted predominantly. The bronchial, there is peribronchial inflammation, but the bronchial walls are not showing that uh, uh, features of necrotizing inflammation of the wall. But on the contrary, in late diseases, they may also have bronchial chest changes. Good. As you can have secondary. Yes. So this is a good point. Case number seven, I'll repeat. 42 year old male, female presented with a history of headache, dizziness, weakness, pain in the upper limbs. Okay. Clinical examination revealed weak radial pulse, section from the carotid pancreas. I'll just go. Uh, so there you can go. Yes, I'll just move. Okay. So can anyone describe what is this? Is the wall, aortic wall, right? Mm -hmm. I'll just tell you the findings. So see, if you observe, do you think the aortic wall is healthy? Vocal? Mm -hmm. Can you repeat the question, sir? By looking, this is the first section, it shows that it is section from the aorta wall, aortic wall. Yes. By looking at no. this, do you think the aortic wall is healthy or no, sir. normal? Sir, uh, more of fibrosis, sir. Yes, there is a lot of fibrosis. Anywhere in the body, any vessel, it will have always, if they are not involved, they will maintain the uh, contour. Can you see this? There is irregularity in the wall. Can you see this? And there is a lot of fibrosis. There is fibrosis. If you see the second picture, can you see this is the adventitial aspect. This whole thickness is the media. And if you divide the media, this part is not showing any nucleus. Right? Yes, sir. Here, towards the adventitia, you have smooth muscle nucleus. There is smooth muscle nuclei loss. Okay? That picture indicates there is 
severe anaplasm nuclei loss. Both muscles are destroyed in this area. Okay. If you see the next slide, again there is the advantage here. So the in the first one, okay, anyway, second one also. Yes. Okay. Yes. And if you see this third, can you see normally in the media, if you see the medial smooth muscle cells are very well oriented. Very well oriented, they are properly arranged. The nucleus will be parallel to the lumen. And if you see this, what is happening? Do you think the nucleus is parallel to the lumen or they are haphazardly arranged? Haphazardly. Yes. So, whenever you see this kind of haphazardness in the vessel, we call that elastic smooth muscle disarray, disorganized arrangement of smooth muscles. We saw irregularity in the wall. We saw nucleus loss, smooth muscle nuclei loss. We saw smooth muscle nuclei disarray. So whenever these things happen, the wall will become weak. The normal structure of the iota will be distorted, and the because of this weak arrangement, the wall will become weak. Why the wall has become weak? If you see more details, can you see there are some patchy chronic inflammation, right? Can you see it here? Yes, sir. The inflammation located. It is in the vessel wall or outside the vessel wall? The outer, uh, uh, the outer part of the media, sir. But the primary structure involved is the media? Media. Yes, sir. If you want to, earlier also, one uh, previously there was a question raised by the resident. Whenever the inflammation predominantly involves the vessel wall, then only you call it as vasculitis primary or true vasculitis. If the vessel wall is involved by secondary inflammation, the reason in cellulitis, adjacent vessel is involved as a process because of cellulitis, don't call it as vasculitis. You should not mention in your report also. right? So when the vessel wall is primarily involved because of inflammation, then you call it as vasculitis. Now, Agam, tell me, is it a primary inflammatory disease of the vessel wall or not? This is the entire media. There is inflammation here. There is inflammation. There is inflammation, 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 inflammation. Adventitia looks fine. Fat. There is a true inflammation of the vessel wall. Yes, sir. Any doubt? Any question, doubts, you can clarify. Inflammation is limited to the vessel media or not? Yes, sir. So, it is a vasculitis. Yes, sir. Understood? It's vasculitis. And rest of all, secondary changes, what you are seeing, medial smooth muscle loss, smooth muscle disarray, areas of fibrosis, they are all can be explained because of the secondary inflammation causing destruction of all these features. And yes. one more important, if you see the adventitious blood vessels, no, usually it will not be that much thick. So whenever you see thick adventitious blood vessels, that indirectly states that the process is a chronic disease. Now tell me, it is an acute or chronic disease? Because I am saying, this is all blood vessels. It is a chronic disease. In fact, major one. If you see this, if you observe, there is an inflammation here, small, small, less of inflammation. This inflammation, they are very much close to the adventitia, but they are within the media. Within the media, they are also there, but predominantly located in the outer one third of the media, which is close to the adventitia, right? What structures do you expect at this location? Which supplies? Which Vasa, vaso, so this inflammation, if you observe, there will be small vessels inside in, in, in between this inflammation. So perivascular inflammation. And see this fourth area? The whole area is totally replaced by fibrosis and it is hyalinized. And you will see small areas of speckled dystrophic calcification as a degenerative process. If you see the observe the periphery of this collagen, you have inflammatory cells. You have granulomas, you have multinucleated giant cells, epithelial histiocytes. Can you see at this magnification? All are there at the periphery of this degeneration. Can you see this? 
they are appearing as if they are preventing the process right they are there in the pictures i will show you few other pictures can you see this big inflammatory infiltrate towards the adrenal tissue there is a blood vessel here right this is blood vessel and see this whole entire thickness of the iron is totally damaged those protein cells just like that in the area of fibrosis right whole the fibrosis here you are seeing some kind of foamy cell aggregates that indicates atherosclerosis and there is lot of inflammation if you see this inflammation and high power majority of this inflammation of plasma cells can you see this collagen degeneration in the wall and yes. observe all those histiocytes and epithelial histiocytes they are guarding this collagen degeneration they are they have come to clear up this collagen degeneration can you see this all the histiocytes i uh, so the Sir, yeah. this area we see it looks almost like a rheumatoid nodule. Yes, correct. Because there's collagen degeneration with those almost cells palisading. You know, it looks yes. uh, like that. So this is. Well, like remember. Aspect. Yes, this is the uh, yes rheumatoid. You explained the similar like appearance. Collagen degeneration in the center, surrounded by histiocytes at the periphery. You may see multinucleated giant cells also, right? Now tell me, is it an infectious granuloma or non-infectious granuloma? By looking at this appearance and morphology. Non-infectious. It's a non-infectious granuloma. Infectious granuloma shows more of a necrosis, neutrophilic separation. So yes, separation. And there are few more pictures depicting or showing. Predominant plasma cell infiltration, severe wall destruction, damage by fibrosis, which all together causing stenosis of the great vessel. When there is stenosis, a particular segment of the vessel, especially the major aorta, is involved. What will happen to the pulse? It will, it will not transmit the pulse, systolic pulse. It will become more of a streamline. and this patient had no pulse in the radial arm so when you see the classification of vasculitis how do you classify this a large vessel vasculitis it is a large vessel vasculitis what are the examples of large vessel vasculitis takayasu and giant cell arteritis takayasu and giant cell arteritis both are almost same with same etiology okay there is a age criteria Yes, sir. 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 Takayasu more commonly affects the major vessel. That is it. Many years ago, the same thing, no, vasa vasorum being infiltrated, narrowed, causing ischemia as well as this inflammation, used to be seen in syphilis. <coughs> But we don't see them nowadays. So that differential is almost out. So it is mainly true. Yes, sir. Hmm. Ultimately, you may have a dystrophic calcification. So you do see calcific deposits on the degenerated area. This is amorphous calcification deposition because it is an inflammatory process. You may have evidence of or increased atherosclerotic changes in these patients. Again, atherosclerosis is again a chronic inflammatory disease of the blood vessels, larger blood vessels. So any inflammation can also enhance. the atherosclerotic process 
So you may see, I also showed in the previous slides, you may have subintimal atherosclerotic changes in these individuals. By, this is the mass and trichrome stain, just to demonstrate. Can you see this? Fibrosis. And these are inflammatory cells, they are surrounding this fibrotic area, and you have plasma cells here. This is perhaps and these stain. Elastin. Yes, elastin stain. Can you see this? Media will have these are called elastic cartridges, you know. When you do elastophagia. Yes. It's all elastic. So some of the remnant elastic fibers, fibers are left here. But here the total elastic tissue is totally gone, replaced by fibrosis. In fact, iota is an elastic artery. You know? Yes, sir. A lot of elastic tissue. This, one. this is elastic. This is perhaps when he is staying. Yes, elastin chain. Can you see this? Media will have, these are called elastic cartridges, you know. When you do... Elastophagia. Yes. It's all elastic. So some of the remnant elastic fibers are left here. But here the total elastic tissue is totally gone, replaced by fibrosis. In fact, iota is an elastic artery. You know? Yes, sir. A lot of elastic tissue. This, one. this is elastic tissue. So all this leads to weakening of the vessel wall. So you may have aortic nar luminal narrowing and also aneurysmal dilatation. Okay, again, few more pictures. Can you see? This is a maintained medial elastic fibers and the inflammation is there at the periphery. The part of the elastic structure is maintained, but here it's totally lost. So even see this. This is missing. You see. Mucin stain, yeah? mucin deposition, it also aggravates mucin deposition. This is present of mucin in the lamella. This is one lamella. Okay, can you see this wavy nature of the elastic fiber here? One smooth muscle, and in between you have a mucin deposition. This we call as intralamellar type of mucin deposition. Is one of the component when you are describing medial degeneration or degenerative aortopathies. Okay. That will take up some other time when we have uh, next similar the iotopathies. You know the iotopathies like Marfan's and others. Marfan syndrome. Where you have a lot of medial degeneration. Uh, this mucin is basically mesenchymal mucin. So not the Yeah, that's the so very chondritis yes. sulfate, heparan sulfate, and those the Hardler disease, mixopolysaccharides, you know, any other things that. Correct. Yes, very good. Yes. So, this is the case of Takayaso arthritis. All of you can identify Takayaso arthritis if you get a specimen. Yes, sir. Yes. So, IHC is not uh, necessary for diagnosis, but for you to understand, you may have T cells. These are B cells, CD20 positive B cells, and dominant two plasma cells. And if you disperse T cells. And you have T cells also, CD3 positive T cells. Is there any other name for this Takayasu or Pulseless disease. Pulseless disease. What is Iota arthritis? Iota arthritis. Takayasu. Non specific Iota arthritis. Non specific Iota arthritis. You have to exclude, although in tuberculosis endemic countries like India, it's our duty to. Exclude the possibility of tuberculosis, right? The most common cause of inflammatory aortitis is tuberculosis. Tuberculosis, where there is para-aortic lymph nodes, that tubercular lymph nodes, they will undergo caseous necrosis, they will rupture, and the inflammation spreads to the adventitia of the blood vessels, major blood vessels, causing it to aneurysmal dilatation. That is the cause, one of the important cause. All of you should know and try to exclude before you label it as non specific iota arthritis. Last case, a young severely immunocompromised male. I will not show this. I just can anyone describe this fast? So, this is a necrotizing large granuloma. Spectrum from left out. Yes, it is a large necrotizing epithelial cell granuloma. You say confluent granuloma. Yes, right? sir. 
कंप्लीट एफेसमेंट ऑफ द लिम्फ नोड आर्किटेक्चर सर फंगल पैथोलॉजी this looks almost uh, not exactly caseous you know that somewhat coagulative like that it looks you see somewhat you see you can get the outline of some cells sometimes in fungal especially those fungi which have a propensity for uh, entering the blood vessels like pheohypomycosis some aspergillus you can get with caseation some coagulation like necrosis see the ghost outline of cells are being seen mm-hmm. so you that is another point if you find neutrophils that is another point but good what sudhi said no you must you cannot rule out tuberculosis outright like that yes. even in immunocompromised tb is again the most common thing yes sir uh, but of course if you have seen some organism organism unless yes sir that's why i saw the next slide what did you see in this fungal spores can yeast yeast like sir yeast like organism which are uh, marked variation in their size sir and uh, there is another slide no next see this yeah, next you see this can you see this yeah yes sir Sir, pseudo, uh, yes. Sir, budding is present, sir. Budding is present. With the broad base. Uh, Acute branch. branch. Branching is present. Right. Mm-hmm. Budding is present. Branching is present. And what is this? Does mm-hmm. whether this fungus? Sir, ingested have, RBC. They have some color to it. Mm-hmm. How many fungus fungal structures you have seen? On H and D, most of the fungus they will have eosinophilic like structures, you know. Mm-hmm. But what are these structures? Which color are these? Brownish. So whenever you see brownish color in the fungi, that is called as chromoblock pigmented fungus. Pigmented fungus. I made this. So okay. the pigmented fungus you have to identify. try to classify okay at least pigmented and non pigmented fungus we can say an hnd so when you have pigmented fungus if you see an hnd you need not have to do special stains for demonstration not required also because pigment itself is very beautifully seen you can identify the fungal life way so what species is it only you can do by specific culture right okay, uh, the, pig- the two ladies no they are silent so <laughs> when you find find uh, fungus What are the things you have to look for? Hmm. That the lady said, Rashmi and who? Ah. And what are the things you have to look in a fungus? Whether they are sir intracellular or uh, no no let the let the two girls <laughs> talk no they have not even to open their mouth other than two cases. Yeah, Rashmi. Uh, in which form they are? Whether yeast form or hyphal hyphal form? Correct. You have to first tell whether they are yeast-like, rounded, or hyphal form. Suppose they are yeast-like. What will you see? Yeast-like. 